She explained about spiritualized mind, higher mind, illumined mind, and intuition. And not the overmind. And now she's going to tell us about the, uh, the realm of truth consciousness, the realm of supermind. In her glorious kingdom of eternal light, all ruler, ruled by none, the truth supreme, omnipotent, omniscient, and alone in a golden country keeps her measureless house. In its corridor she hears the tread that comes out of the unmanifest never to return till the unknown is known and seen by men. Above the stretch and blaze of cosmic sight, above the silence of the wordless thought, formless creator of immortal forms, nameless, investitured with the name divine, transcending times ours, transcending timelessness. The mighty mother sits in lucent calm and holds the eternal child upon her knees, attending the day when he shall speak to fate. There is the image of our future's hope. There is the sun for which all darkness waits. There is the imperishable harmony. The world's contradictions climb to her and are one. There is the truth of which the world's truth are shreds, the light of which the world's ignorance is the shade till truth draws back the shade that it has cast, the love our hearts call down to heal all strife, the bliss for which the world's derelict sorrows yearn. Thence comes the glory sometimes seen on earth, the visits of Godhead to the human soul, the beauty and the dream on nature's face. There the perfection born from eternity calls to it the perfection born in time. The truth of God surprising human life, the image of God overtaking finite shapes. There in a world of everlasting light in the realms of the immortal supermind, truth who hides here her head in mystery, 
her riddle deemed by reason impossible in the stark structure of material form unenigmaed lives unmasked her face and there is nature and the common law of things there in a body made of spirit stuff the half stone of the ever living fire action translates the movements of the soul thought steps infallible and absolute and life is a continual worships right a sacrifice of rapture to the one a cosmic vision a spiritual sense feels all the infinite lodged in finite form and seen through a quivering ecstasy of light discovers the bright face of the bodiless in the truth of a moment in the moment soul can sip the honey wine of eternity the one mystic infinite person of his world multiplies his myriad personality on all his bodies seals his divinity stamp and sits in each immortal and unique the immobile stands behind each daily act a background of the movement and the scene upholding creation on its might and calm and change on the immutable's deathless poise the timeless looks out from the traveling hours the ineffable puts on a robe of speech where all its words are woven like magic threads moving with beauty inspiring with their gleam and every thought takes up its destined place recorded in the memory of the world the truth supreme vast and impersonal fits faultlessly the hour and circumstance its substance a pure gold ever the same but shaped into vessels for the spirit's use its gold becomes the wine jar and the vase all there is a supreme epiphany the all wonderful makes a marvel of each event the all beautiful is a miracle in each shape the all blissful smites with rapture the heart's throbs a pure celestial joy is the use of sense each being there is a member 
of the self, a portion of the million thoughted all, a claimant to the timeless unity, the many sweetness, the joy of difference, edged with the intimacy of the one. So this is the place in Savitri where Sri Aurobindo tells most about the supermind. There is another shorter passage in Book 1, Canto 5, but this is the main place where Savitri describes the nature of the truth realm. So let's see how much we can understand about that. Rosa, you'll begin. Kingdom of eternal light, all truth, ruler, ruled by him, now the truth is omnipotent, omniscient, and alone. In a golden cup, here, measureless house, in its corridor, she hears the three thread that, that comes out from the unmanifest never to return till the unknown is known and seen by man. Hmm. So this is the kingdom of truth, her glorious kingdom of eternal light. And there, truth is the all ruler. She rules everything. And she is not ruled by anything. She's the supreme ruler, the supreme truth omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, and alone. She rules alone. There she keeps her measureless house, her house that is vast and infinite, but she keeps it in a golden country. Gold is the color and the substance of the supramental world. And there in that measureless house, there is a corridor, there's a passage coming. And in a passage she hears approaching the footsteps the tread that comes out of the unmanifest, out of what is not yet manifested, all the infinite possibilities of the one, things pass through that corridor into her truth world. She hears their steps coming along the corridor. In its corridor, she hears the tread that comes out of the unmanifest. And those things that come through that corridor, out of the unmanifest, into the realm of truth, will never come back the other way until the unknown is known and seen by men until the divine life has been established upon earth. 
I think this is powers and possibilities. But as you walk along a corridor, uh, sometimes your footsteps echo. Yes. So we don't know what are those many possibilities that are coming out of the unmanifest into the manifestation. They have to pass through that corridor, through the house of truth, in order to enter into the manifested universe. Why it is interesting because he says, uh, never to return, it is, it is seen by all. So if it's for each person, then it's different story. Mm. Or if it's each, uh, let's say, broader thing, much bigger thing. Mm. That yeah, I think yeah. these are powers and possibilities. And perhaps when everything, all the unknown is known and seen by men, when the divine life has uh, manifested on earth, perhaps we may all go back along that cor corridor into the unmanifest, maybe. Hmm. Okay, Martin? Above the stretch and blaze of cosmic silence, above the silence of the world restored, formless creator of immortal forms, nameless, Investiture with the name divine, transcending time's hours, transcending timelessness, the mighty mother sits in youth and calm, and holds the eternal child upon her knees, attending the day when he shall speak to faith. Hmm. So this world this glorious kingdom of eternal light is above the stretch, the wide scope and the dazzling light of the cosmic sight. It's above the highest level of the universe. It's above even the silence of the wordless thought that hasn't been put into words. There sits the Mighty Mother in lucent calm, full of light all around her. Everything is very, very calm and still. She is the formless creator of immortal forms. She herself doesn't have any fixed form but she gives birth to all the typal forms, the ideal forms, the immortal forms. She has no name. We can't think of her name. We just call her the Mighty Mother. But she is investitured with the divine, with the name divine. It's as if she puts that on as a kind of robe, we call her the Mighty Mother, Supreme Shakti, Parashakti. We give her all kinds of divine names. There in her house where she sits in that realm of truth, she is transcending the hours of time. She is beyond time. But she's also beyond timelessness. She can enter into time. She's not limited by timelessness. There she sits in lucent calm and she holds on her knees the eternal child attending. This here it means waiting for. waiting for the day when that golden child will speak to fate and everything will change. Investiture. Investiture. 
In England, the queen now and then, she holds investitures. She invites people who've done some outstanding work or service to the country, and she gives them some decoration that they can wear, some insignia, some sign, and a special ending to their names. So it means something that you can put on which indicates your rank and your achievements. So she is nameless, but we give her these names to mark different aspects that we see in her. Who is the eternal child? The eternal child. Who can the eternal child be but the Lord himself? <laughs> Ever young, always playing. <laughs> yes, Narendra, please read. There is the image of our future's hope. There is the sun for which all darkness waits. There is the imperishable harmony. The world's contradictions climb to her and are one. There is the truth of which the world's truth are shreds. The light of which the world's ignorance is the shape. Till truth draws back the shape that has cast the love our hearts call down to be all strife, the bliss for which the world's derelict sorrows young, thence comes the glory sometimes seen on earth, the visits of Godhead to the human soul, the beauty and the dream of on the nature's face. Yes. So already existing there is an image, uh, an appearance of everything that we can hope for in the future. All the blessed things we might hope for and imagine waiting for us in the future. And there in that country is the sun, a very special sun, that highest and most auspicious form of the sun which will uh, illumine us with the truth. That's the sun for which all darkness is longing. And there is the imperishable harmony. This is the great characteristic of the supramental world, that all contradictions are in harmony there. Every, I mean, everything that here seems like a contradiction, an opposition, something irreconcilable. There, everything is in imperishable harmony, a harmony that can't be disturbed or destroyed. All the opposite tendencies of the world, the world's contradictions, are climbing up to the Mighty Mother, and there, when they reach her, they all join together and become one. They are not contradictions anymore. They are aspects of the one. There is the truth of which the world's truths are shreds. Shreds, shredding is what you do with carrots. No? <laughs> so, in, a, in our world, what we have are little fragments of truth. They're all fragments of one truth. We cling on to them and we claim this is the truth and that is the truth. These are all shreds of that one truth. That is their ruling in that world. And also there is the light, that light with a capital L. Our world's ignorance is like a shade 
over that light. Now here the lamps have shades, not the ones at the back. There's something so that we don't see the full light which might be painful to the eyes. No? So there is the full light. Our ignorance is a shade over that light. And it will remain like that until the truth herself draws back. She takes away that shade that she herself has cast. There too is the love that our hearts are longing for, the love, the supreme love that will be able to heal all strife, all conflict and quarreling and uh, clash and the bliss, the bliss for which the world's derelict sorrows yearn. We are all longing for bliss. No? And he uses this word derelict. Something that's derelict is completely tumbled down and um, it's not even exactly like a slum. In a slum people put together uh, ramshackle houses out of bits and pieces, no? But they are living in them. It's a house. But our sorrows, it's, it's as if they're completely abandoned and broken down, no? They want to be healed by that divine bliss of the mother. And then we have this word, thence, from there. From that country comes the glory sometimes seen on earth. If we have some wonderful divine experience, it's really coming. Its origin is from that world. When the individual form of the divine, the Godhead, the Lord, visits the human soul, He's coming from there. And the beauty that we see in nature, it's coming from that realm. And the dream on nature's face, as if as um, th that beautiful face of nature is dreaming of even higher and more perfect beauty. Which means that God has given us capital beauty just in Yes. Sometimes it's small and I can't, it's not consistent throughout the poem. It's one of these things, you know, that Sri Aurobindo never had a chance to finally and fully revise it. And many of these, all these later passages were taken down by dictation. So we can't be sure how significant it is when there's a big or a little letter. This he was writing at the end of the 1940s. Mm. I mean... Near is Yes. Um, the whole first part of Savitri, that is up to the end of book three, he got it more or less into its present complete form by about 1944, after many, many, many revisions. After that, he didn't make so many revisions. It's as if he had got it completely clear in his consciousness what he wanted to do, and he wasn't experimenting anymore. He had decided that, yes, it can be finished and it can be published. The first uh, lines were published in 1946 for the first, a passage. He gave permission for that to be published. So he went, he was taking up books four and five and six, books four and five I think in uh, perhaps 1946. And then so far as we know, book seven, the book of 
Yoga was written in 1947 and um, then he went on with that. So this, I think, belongs to the late 1940s, 48, 49. Nirod Baran, in his book, 12 Years with Sri Aurobindo, has attempted to give a kind of overview, but he says his memory is not good and he doesn't remember clearly. But he specifically says that when it came to um, books 10 and 11, Sri Aurobindo didn't hesitate Whenever Nirod was free to take that di uh, dictation, um, Sri Aurobindo would just pour out the lines as quickly as he could take them. He didn't stop and think or anything like that. That was for books 10 and 11. And then when he came back to do revisions and book 6, Canto 2, especially seems to have taken a long time and that's what he was working on at the very end. And so books 8 and 12 did not receive final revision. But um, books nine, uh, 10 and 11, they were OK. So we can say this is Well, we will see with book 11, that's really the climax of his creative expression. But this already is getting there, no? <laughs> um, Bhuvana. The, the perfection born from eternity calls to each the perfection born in time. The truth of God the rising human life, the image of God overtaking finite shapes. So this is that aspect of harmonization. The supermind is not just up there, no, it's in contact with our world. So there the perfection born from eternity is exerting some kind of attraction. It's calling to the perfection, whatever perfection we can call, we can achieve here. It's getting called up there. So there are aspects of the influence of that world, the truth of God, surprising, suddenly overtaking our human lives and revealing things unexpectedly. And the image of God overtaking human shapes. I think it's not in the sense of overtaking like a car may overtake you. It's in the sense of taking over. The image of God takes over, inhabits human shapes. Let's come from that realm. Which God has really come the main God in the history of humankind? Well, if we talk about Godhead with a small g, every one of us has a Godhead within us. You know? And in different parts of the poem, perhaps he's speaking about different Godheads. In Book 11, when we come there, we will see Savitri meets a Godhead who contains within him the, four, uh, the fourfold expression of um, Virat, the Virat, the, the Lord of the material world, Hiranyagarbha, the, the golden child who's dreaming the subtle worlds, Prajna, the supreme reason, uh, supreme wisdom, which has shaped or conceived all this, and then the Turiya, the fourth state which can't be described or named or conceived in any way. These are four. But you will notice he doesn't always name things. <laughs> Not using the traditional names. He often, of course, alludes to Krishna, who was his own special uh, love and Guru. 
What about the reflection of morning time? I don't see much reflection on earth, actually. No, I, the thing he means at that time, what is perfect? Like when in the era where he takes a shape, hmm. he takes the form which is required by that time. Depends that like, uh, we have the samadhas, so bhara for that particular period of time and then some of the things that nature does are so perfect. This morning, um, Dana Lakshmi took me out in the rain to show me, you can have a look when you go outside, there are some pots with cactus plants in. And um, there are different types of cactuses and different types of cactuses at the moment are flowering. And there's one flower there it's absolutely mind-blowing. I can't even describe it to you, but you would have to go and see it. With many, many small flowers, with, uh, I, I don't know how much, many petals they have, but how perfectly every petal is patterned. It's not, although they are so small, they have complex patterns. It's just so perfectly done. <laughs> so this, and of course, if we look with a microscope into the structure of uh, the cells of plants, or the um, the structure of minerals and uh, uh, metals, so amazingly perfect. And Shobindo has said that that perfection, which is there in the lower levels of nature is an expression of the involved supermind. So that's the source of the perfection, whatever perfection, on whatever level, at whatever time. Uh, it can only be perfect because the supermind is behind it or involved in it. Um, Suresh, you will read. That in your work of everlasting life in the realms of the immortal supermoon, who had 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 in history, had been 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 by reason impossible in the strong structure of material form. Unenigmat. Un Unenigmat views unmask her face and death. His nature and the common law of things. Yes. <clears throat> so there in that world of everlasting light, in the realms and the kingdoms of the immortal supermind, Truth, who here hides her head in mystery. There's something always mysterious about truth. Hmm? With her riddle, the puzzle that truth poses to us, it's so complex. Here, reason thinks that it's impossible to solve that riddle here in this stark structure of material forms. How could that mystery of truth ever be expressed in material forms? Hmm? There lives unenigmat. An enigma is a riddle or a puzzle, something that's difficult to solve. So there in that realm, the truth is obvious. There's nothing puzzling and bewildering and mysterious about it at all. Her face is unmasked. There, she is nature. She's what is natural and normal. No? The common law of things. So here we have a 
a material nature, an earth nature. We have the, the mother of life and the mother of mind. There, she, truth, is the, the mighty mother. Um, Lela, you would read? There, in a rotting made of spirit stuff, the earth half, half stone. Half stone of the ever living fire. Action trans translates, uh, action translates the movements of the soul. Four steps infallible and absolute, and life is a continual worship's flight, the sacrifice of the lecture to the one. Yes. So there, there are beings, and they have bodies, no? and they act. They th there is thought, there is life. All those things are there. Hmm? The body is made of a different kind of substance from this dense physical gross matter that we know. It is the bodies are made of spirit stuff. And that um, those bodies are like altars on which the fire of sacrifice burns. He says the hearth stone. A hearth is a place where we burn a fire. And in the Vedic sacrifice they used to build uh, altars like that for sacrifice. So this ever-living fire is the eternal flame of sacrifice, of offering and interaction with the Supreme. The body is that hearthstone, the foundation on which the sacrifice can be offered. So the actions, whatever actions are taken, they directly translate the movements of the soul. Unfortunately, that's not always true of us because the body finds it difficult to respond. The life finds it difficult to respond. But there, everything is responding directly to the movements of the soul. So the thought, it's not an ignorant thought. It's a golden, vast, pure, true thought. It's infallible. It can't make mistakes. It's absolute. It has a quality of absoluteness to it. And life is like, all the actions of life are like a continual uh, rite of worship, a continual puja of offering, of worship and sacrifice. A sacrifice of rapture, of intense delight to the one. Lord, take all this, enjoy. Gumsun. Hmm? A cosmic vision, a spiritual sense, fills all the infinite logic in finite form, and seems through a pure expansive of life. This covers the wide face of the body, bodiless. In the two sober moments, in the moment of soul, can shift the heart. Only one, only yes. So what is the consciousness like there? It has a cosmic vision, a universal vision that can see everything, even in all detail, at once. That's the power of vision. Everything can be clearly seen. And it makes use of senses or a sense as we do. Our consciousness makes use of our senses. No? But the, that is a spiritual sense which 
knows everything very, very intimately. So that cosmic vision and that spiritual sense feel all the infinite lodged, staying in finite form. In any finite form, all the infinite is dwelling. We can't uh, grasp that or imagine it, but Sri Aurobindo tells us it is so. And when we see miracles like those flowers <laughs> that, she, that Dana Lakshmi showed me this morning, we can see, yes, the infinite is dwelling even in the smallest forms. So there that's very, very obvious. And there it's possible to see through a shimmering, quivering light which is full of ecstasy, of delight. That cosmic vision and spiritual sense discovers it can see the bright face, bright appearance of what has no body actually, the bodiless. He ex may express himself through bodies or faces or forms, but he's not limited by a body. And that cosmic vision and spiritual sense in the truth of a moment in time, in the moment's soul, can sip the honey wine of eternity. Sip is when you take just a little drink, no? Just a little bit. So in the moment, you can get just a sip of eternity, of what is beyond all time. That honey wine, that extreme sweetness of eternity. Sarojini. The spirit who is no one and innumerable. innumerable, the one mystic infinity person of his one, multiplies his myriad personality, one of his bodies sends his divinity and sits in its immortal and unique. Yes, thank you. So there in that realm there is a spirit, the spirit of that world. He is no one, but at the same time he's so many people we he can't count them. Innumerable. He's in all these innumerable forms. He's the one person, the one conscious being who has, is inhabiting that world. But he multiplies his myriad personality into so many forms that they can't be counted. And on each of those individual expressions of himself, he puts his stamp, his mark, to show that his divinity is in each one of them. He sits in each one of them, immortal and unique. Each one of those expressions of the Lord is unique, different. Each of them is expressing some different aspect of him. That's true of us here in this world, but we don't know it. That's what our souls are here for, to be or to become unique persons of the one. Patricia. The Amoba stands behind each day we have. The background of the movement and the scene, upholding creation on its light and calm and change on the musical, selfless forms. Hmm. 
So this is an interesting thing that Sri Aurobindo points out to us. That behind everything that moves, behind all action, there has to be supporting it something that doesn't move, what is immobile. You know? So we don't see that happening. But there in that world it's clear that the unmoving, the one who doesn't move, who doesn't change, is standing behind each daily act, each small thing that any of his forms does. His, the immobile, is a background of all the movement and the scene, the changing scene. It's upholding, holding up creation, all the variety of the creation on its might, its power, and its calm. It supports change on the deathless poise, the poise is where there's a perfect balance no? of the immutable, the one who doesn't change. Mutable means changing. That is what is immutable doesn't change. I think we'll stop there for today. In her glorious kingdom of eternal light, all ruler, ruled by none, the truth supreme, omnipotent, omniscient and alone in a golden country keeps her measureless house in its corridor she hears the tread that comes out of the unmanifest never to return till the unknown is known and seen by men. Above the stretch and blaze of cosmic sight, above the silence of the wordless thought, formless creator, of immortal forms, nameless, investitured with the name divine, transcending times ours, transcending timelessness, the mighty mother sits in loosened calm, and holds the eternal child upon her knees, attending the day when he shall speak to fate. There is the image of our future's hope. There is the sun for which all darkness waits. There is the imperishable harmony. The world's contradictions climb to her and are one. There is the truth of which the world's truths are shreds the light of which the world's ignorance is the shade, till truth draws back the shade that it has cast. The love our hearts call down to heal all strife, 
the bliss for which the world's derelict sorrows yearn. Thence comes the glory sometimes seen on earth, the visits of Godhead to the human soul, the beauty and the dream on nature's face. There, the perfection born from eternity calls to it the perfection born in time, the truth of God surprising human life, the image of God overtaking finite shape. There, in a world of everlasting light, in the realms of the immortal supermind, truth who hides here her head in mystery, her riddle deemed by reason impossible, in the stark structure of material form. Unenigmed lives, unmasked her face, and there is nature and the common law of things. There, in a body made of spirit stuff, the hearthstone of the ever-living fire. Action translates the movements of the soul. Thought steps infallible and absolute. And life is a continual worship's rite. A sacrifice of rapture to the one. A cosmic vision, a spiritual sense, feels all the infinite lodged in finite form, and seen through a quivering ecstasy of light, discovers the bright face of the bodiless. In the truth of a moment, in the moment soul can sip the honey wine of eternity. A spirit who is no one and innumerable, the one mystic infinite person of his world, multiplies his myriad personality, on all his bodies seals his divinity's stamp, and sits in each immortal and unique. The immobile stands behind each daily act, a background of the movement and the scene, upholding creation on its might and calm, and change on the immutable's deathless poise.